Good evening and welcome. This is the People's Platform. Our guest tonight has worked extensively on community development and its intersectionality in water, sanitation, hygiene, climate and water security locally, regionally as well as internationally. She also leaves no holds barred in calling a spade a spade. Our topic tonight is engaging communities as catalysts in community development. I'm so pleased to welcome uh, award-winning environment and climate change advocate uh, Kusum Atukorala, who also functions as the regional chair of the Global Water Partnership in South Asia. Good evening and welcome. Good evening, Sonali. Thank you very much for inviting me. Lovely to have you. Uh, Ms. Atukorala, um, Condensing this conversation to 40 min minutes uh, is going to prove very challenging because of the multitude of areas that we have to cover. But um, before we get into uh, climate change and water security, I'd like to draw your attention to this incident where a few months ago, uh, the government wasted time, uh, resources on dictating the attire of female school teachers as a result of which there was a massive debate mm -hmm. uh, on varying aspects at present we see uh, the aftermath of an economic crisis that was politically created uh, where school children have no way of going to school in, in certain um, areas of Sri Lanka because they don't have uniforms, they don't have shoes, they don't have books uh, and parents are unable to send their children to school. So speak to us about the, the hypocrisy, the, the issues uh, that Sri Lanka is facing at present. Yes, Sonali. Actually, uh, working with schools, school sanitation, school wash has been, you know, a quite an important part of the work that I do. And uh, I am uh, quite uh, distressed because many, many of the schools that I work with are the marginalized schools. They are estate sector schools, there are small rural schools. And every one of those schools is having children who are finding it difficult to come to school. I don't want to waste a lot of time about the cost of living and the perma crisis that we seem to be finding ourselves in the, ed in the education sector. But uh, I would like us to reflect that if there is anything that you know Sri Lanka has achieved, it is the achievements of health and sanitation. These are global achievements which are, you know, which we need to fight to make sure that we retain it for the next generation. I'd like to show this picture where, you know, it's one of my favorite pictures taken on the Anuradhapura road where this woman in a tiny little kade, in a tiny little shop, is sitting and reading a newspaper. That is a gift that many women in South Asia and in Asia or even in the globe just do not have. Mm -hmm. The power of literacy, the gift of literacy, because when you give a woman the gift of literacy, automatically it comes to the children. Mm -hmm. But now, if we have a problem where children cannot go to school, where they may be dropping out of school, where they may be drawn into as casual labor in the informal sector, where they could be getting, uh, you know, girls could be married off early because the family simply can't keep them. Mm. They will be having underage uh, pregnancies mm. and maybe underweight babies. I think we are looking at a whole series of issues which can come from this one issue. Sen sen not being able to send the girls to school, I think it is absolutely priority and we need to have a situation where we have not a blanket program but targeted assistance to help those who are failing to go to school. If we talk about this from a macro uh, point of view, um, some of the initiatives already taken by the government. Sri Lanka's Climate Prosperity Plan was recently launched, outlining the national investment strategy to secure Sri Lanka's future in a climate insecure world. Uh, addressing COP27 in Egypt in November, the president uh, made certain undertakings. Um, we see how varying stakeholders have been set up, established, um, with tasks, uh, however, the, the there's a stark difference. There's a massive gap between 
these institutions and the ground realities faced by communities. How important is it uh, to have these communities themselves seated at the decision making table because they are the ones who suffer at the end of the day. Yeah, I think that uh, the organization that I am uh, regional chair of, you know, the Global Water Partnership strongly believes in an integrated approach, bringing in all the stakeholders, the institutions, the agencies, the uh, academia, the private sector, very important, and also the communities. Mm. Because it, the water is really became very well recognized at COP27, but water is the critical factor for climate change. I, I mean, if you look, if I look at your programs, I would only, you know, maybe see either floods or droughts mm. or probably both of it or mm. wildfires to add to the, you know, the misery. So basically it is a lot of water or the lack of water. Right. So understanding that water is too important to be left to the decision making of one agency or one group. I think it brings us to the point where we can make all these people, the stakeholders come together understanding their issues, understanding their problems, also understanding their solutions. I think that you know a lot of the solutions that we call for may come from the community itself. So community engagement is very important in this perma crisis of water. We tend to speak of uh, literacy, however environmental literacy among Sri Lankans is a whole other thing. Uh, we are not very literate when it comes to the environment. Um, where can we find these skills, inculcate these skills? Uh, for me, a lot of the work that I have been doing has been what you could probably call water advocacy. That we try and inform groups, especially those who have not had access to that kind of information through programs, uh, um, the Country Water Partnership in Sri Lanka, the Sri Lanka Water Partnership has had a long history of doing publications, small publications, you know, related to uh, some of the themes which we are working on. Now these are themes, uh, books on Singhala and Tamil about school sanitation. Right. Now it is important for us to put out this kind of information but because this is a small uh, piece of paper but it gives a lot of information to people who will never think about right. what are the impacts of school sanitation. What is the impact of having a school which doesn't have a toilet? I, if I remember right, I uh, at somebody said that 600 schools in Sri Lanka do not have a toilet at all. I have gone to many schools which either do not have a proper toilet or no toilet at all. I mean having a dysfunction. That's mind boggling. My program really started when I went to do a climate change program in a school which had 1000 children, girls and boys 500, 500, 10 toilets and only one boy's toilet was usable. No. I was looking for a toilet and that was the only thing that okay. I could find. So you know that we spend so much of time, energy, making sure that you know we get the 6 A's, the 7 A's etc. But not having a toilet and not having water during school time can have an extremely detrimental impact on the children. Those problems may come up later on. And most of all, we, I am extremely concerned in working on that area because of menstrual hygiene management. Imagine the situation where you have a girl child who is a menstruating but has no access to a toilet. What do they do? Well, quite a lot of the studies that we have done shows that they don't go to school for four days. So you are losing out on four days of education, which is so important to you. Mm. So what is being done about this? I think the problem has now been recognized by um, well, the, the government, mm -hmm. but the fact is that, you know, we all have to do something to make sure that these schools which are left behind come up to the same level. Mm -hmm. Now, in uh, with, uh, with these organizations that I have been working with, one solution has to be giving is to give rainwater harvesting systems. The rainwater harvesting system captures water mm -hmm. from the, in the, the roof. Yeah. We use usually this but 5,000 litre plastic shells, so that we usually try and link it to the toilet. Okay. This is not drinking water that we provide. But it is water to keep the toilets flushed, the toilets cleaned and 
to make sure that you know there is an environment where a menstruating girl can come to school knowing that there is something that she can use. Right. In menstrual hygiene management is not only a problem for uh, the schools. In very many of the organizations that you go to, I mean even in some of the universities, you may have issues where these toilets, uh, the lack of toilets is a problem for girl students. Mm -hmm. Most of your field work uh, revolves around uh, engaging with marginalized communities and rural schools. Speak to us about this. A lot of the work that we, uh, I feel has to be done is to work with the people who live in the catchments because the catchments are our water towers and those water towers need to be protected. We have to have good stewardship. In the end, it is those people who live there who can best look after the water towers and the catchments. So those schools are very often either estate schools, you know, estate sector schools or remote rural schools. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the kind of information that we are talking about, the programs that we are doing, rarely go to those schools because they are far too far away. Okay. And nowadays, I think with the petrol crisis, they are even more far away. So basically, we try to access them but uh, when we, uh, I would say that my, some of my best moments and the most heartwarming moments have been working with the estate sector schools in Uwa, um, Uwa, Nuarelia, Haputale, you know, because when we come and do a program, they are so interested. I mean, they just soak it up like a sponge. Right. You know, I, as you can see in this picture, they are, you know, they are doing their own homework and they are giving us the list of works that they can do. Mm. And then I also saw that uh, uh, that children can take become a catalyst, taking this message to the elders. Now, in this other picture, it is the school uh, uh, in Norelia doing a dance drama about water protection and water conservation at the master shed. The master shed is where all the women come with their tea you know, at the end of the day with the tea bags. Mm. So they were taking that opportunity to capture the, you know, the people who are there and give them the message on water, the importance of water conservation. You know, so we use art, we use music, you know, where we use marchers, different ways of, you know, uh, I would say non-traditional ways, not the lecture type, not the preaching, we are, but ways in which we can get them also to contribute. It is not a one-way learning. It is a two-way learning because we learn as much as we give. When we speak of the, the practical aspects of uh, climate change adaptability vis-a-vis uh, -vis the communities, how important is it to create linkages between the communities as well as uh, the government agencies, academia, uh, professionals, the corporate sector? How do we do this? Actually, a really good program, to my mind, brings together at least three of those groups. Right. You know, very often, the private sector, which has been supporting us in uh, different ways, in um, uh, supporting communities, building rainwater harvesting systems for schools, uh, even um, starting up the menstrual hygiene management programs, I'm very pleased to say, was funded by a bank. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you one would say, what does a bank have to do with menstrual hygiene management, right. but they understood the linkages, mm. the linkages between MHM, uh, sanitation, education, the, you know, so that entire stream has been understood. It was not easy because, you know, menstrual hygiene management is a bit of a controversial, very con it's a conservative country. Sometimes you cannot talk very openly about it. I can tell you a very uh, funny story which happened because the first time when we started the uh, MHM program and we sent letters and we had uh, people coming and saying, uh, you know, MHM is Artava Swastata in Singhala. Mm -hmm. So they came and said, we have come for the Artika Vidya program. And then when we started the program, half the men in the group got up and said, these are women's things, we don't want to be here. Mm. So it was difficult for us to get 
true, but with the support from good educational zonal uh, officers, mm -hmm. I think that that is where we could make that breakthrough. You need to have the convincing power to ensure that people buy into your program. Right. You need not, you know, you don't go and preach and say, you know, this is what should be done. We have to work with them to talk it, talk through a activity why it is needed, and make them partners. Mm -hmm. It is only that partnership which will work in the long run. Climate change and water security are intricately interwoven. Um, there are two upcoming um, conferences, international conferences, uh, the UN Water Conference coming up in March in New York and the World Water Forum in Bali in 2024. Uh, speak to us about how important it is for the Sri Lankan state to take active measures to not wait until uh, these conferences to come up, but to have a, a cogent, uh, holistic plan in place to ensure we have a proper water management plan and system. Yeah, I think that it is, uh, uh, you know, Sri Lanka has always been known traditionally for its uh, wonderful traditional uh, irrigation systems and its hydraulic society you know it is yeah. uh, very well known but i am personally very upset because sometimes i feel that we use the words of king parakram bahu not a drop of water shall fall to the ground without being made use for mankind on the 22nd of march world water day and then we forget it mm. so i think it is important that this make this has to happen every day of the year, not only on that one day. We have enough issues, we have enough challenges overcome, we have very good professionals, and we have also, uh, 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 I mean, achievements, which we can easily showcase at a World Water Forum. We have done uh, in many in many of these uh, uh, places that I'm talking about. There has been success stories. Mm. There have been success stories which are uh, um, uh, not known to anybody. Okay. And there are also success stories which uh, uh, I mean are sort of I would say blown out of proportion. So uh, both these things are there. We need to be we need to be careful how we select, but. A World Water Forum is a place where we can highlight the traditional uh, wealth of knowledge which came to us through the, uh, the hydraulic, ancient hydraulic civilization. Mm. But it can also uh, highlight how we are manipulating and how we are using it to deal with the current situation, the current challenges which is coming to us. We are running short of water in some places. I believe I saw that we had uh, had to send uh, uh, water bowsers to Singaraja. If you read the newspapers, it's especially these tiny little pieces of information in the middle pages, you will find that there are so many places which are running short of water. There are so many issues that are coming because of pollution of water. This is a major problem for us. Okay. There are so many uh, mega development projects which take place in a short-sighted manner with no uh, environmental impact assessment, feasibility study, uh, I mean that is believable, that takes place. Um, policy makers don't seem to care about the ill effects caused to the environment, to the community. How do we grapple with this cancer of greed and power and all of that? I think that the only thing that we can do as uh, social interlocutors, as academics, as water professionals is to strengthen the communities which are affected, Right. to give them the power. Now, I always like to say that, you know, women are the climate change um, foot soldiers. Right. We should make them into, if not generals, at least make them into sergeants. Mm -hmm. You know, give them the knowledge, give them that support. And communities which are supported can sometimes come up with their own solutions. I, I think a lot of the, the, the friction and, the, you know, these um, uh, situations that we see sometimes in, uh, in the media as well, 
comes because there has not been proper awareness before the project, before that there has been no uh, uh, information flow to the community. You know, suddenly a community will wake up and find that, you know, some road is being cut through a catchment, maybe a uh, tank is being, uh, you know, the bunt is being damaged. Only when it happens, they should know that and they should be able to understand the implications and the impacts on their own livelihoods mm -hmm. and their lives. We are in conversation with uh, Ms. Kusum Atukorala. We go in for a short commercial break. We'll be right back. लाभ <laughs> A very good evening and welcome back to The Brief at 30 here on TV1. The Brief at 30. The Brief at 30 here on TV1. Welcome back to The Brief at 30 on TV1. Views can be overwhelming, but we make it simple. Watch The Brief at 30 on TV1, Facebook Live and YouTube every weekday 9.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. To watch online, look for the newsfirst.lk English page on Facebook and hit the like button or search for at newsfirst.english on YouTube and subscribe to the News First English page. Don't forget to hit the notification bell. The Brief at 30, your trusted Ali News update. Oh wait, The Brief at 30, next up, take care. Oh, we need to ensure that the government is productive enough. But institutions are not working, we are looking for a talisman. Oh now even the exports, uh, we saw the numbers having grown. The issue with local council elections is that it has become just part of the party political dynamics of this country. Face the Nation, Wednesday nights at 9.30 on TV1. जनता सती दिन वाले सबस आए दिए थे। Welcome back to the People's Platform. We're in conversation with Kusum Atukorala. She's the regional chair for the Global Water Partnership South Asia. It is important to have a multi-stakeholder, multi-sectoral approach when it comes to uh, water security and climate change and the discourses surrounding it. Uh, education plays a key role. Let's talk a bit about how the education system and the school curriculum needs to uh, be constantly updated to incorporate all of this and also the role of university students. Yeah, I think uh, I ca can't really comment on uh, how the changes in the education, uh, the school education system because I'm not engaged in that. But I'd like to present two uh, activities which are like ongoing now or recently concluded. One is that uh, the Global Water Partnership had a, uh, with, uh, got a little bit of money to do something called a gender follow-up activity for South Asia. This is after quite some time. Gender is an issue I had been pushing for the 20 years that I have been engaged with GWP. So I was very pleased. So we could do a, an activity with a university in Sri Lanka. We called it the Citizen Science Program, an activity for climate advocacy. Basically, it 
meant that we supported the we are children uh, the students of the University of Uwelasse which means you know we had good support from the university which I really appreciate and we did a training which uh, enabled them to go out as climate change advocates to a community a community based organization right. about so on the one hand we are giving them a training on the other hand we are using them as catalyst to approach a community now this is something that i feel that we should be doing because it builds both parties it strengthens the community because they were also able to you know give uh, share some of their problems share some of their issues but the, the the university students also we are giving them a role beyond what is usually traditionally used the other one that i'm uh, happy that to be engaged in is a activity which is going on with the university of jaffna department of community uh, medicine where we are doing a initial study and an activity on menstrual hygiene management so i think that these are programs which are for me uh new programs which are being uh, uh, brought into the university system so i think that it, if we can have uh, opportunities for few for future students to engage with communities it will be a two way learning system for both of the, both groups it is so important to make sure that policy makers are also on the right side of history is there political will to ensure that um we are ahead uh, in the fields of water security climate change climate change adaptation yeah so now you sort of uh, hit the nail on the head and the nail starts in the year 2000 in the uh, world water forum in the hague one of the most important statements of the hague forum was that we should involve political decision make accessing political decision makers mm -hmm. was one thing that they really informed emphasized and the i have been seeing this come up and down in different ways where we have a political decision maker who is concerned who is sensitized who understands the importance of the issues that we are talking about water security uh, sanitation for schools we have made enormous strides for uh, there was a, a time where the ministry of water supply and drainage uh, you know these ministries keep changing their names i think that was the name <laughs> that they had uh, they uh, had a uh, a panel of uh, stakeholders from all sectors you know academia private sector the un agencies the ministries coming into what we used to call the water sand committee water and sanitation committee okay. this was very useful because you know it gave us a platform to discuss certain issues it uh, it uh, gave us a platform to understand what other act people are doing instead of working in silos the the silo problem is i think it's not only in the water sector it is in many sectors and then that that leads to decision making which is very narrow minded we need to go from a wide angle lens mm. a wide angle vision and a wide angle perspective mm. so, now the watson committee unfortunately does seem to be in abeyance for some reason i do hope that it will be brought up again and made effective because in this current situation where we are having water related issues we are we having sanitation related issues we are we have a this crisis in the school systems we are we need to talk more about you know girls going into school and having access to those sanitation a watson committee would be very useful it's a good sounding board for mm. what's happening apart from and in addition to that what other measures need to be urgently taken i think that we need to have some kind of targeted assistance to reach the people who are being left behind if you look at that card it is my uh, you know i always put out these cards with the theme and in 2019 the theme was leave no one behind so nali unfortunately many children are being left behind now because of this current situation the current poverty simply not being able to go to school or because you don't have a uniform because you don't have money to buy the books so but from the water angle it is i think our duty my duty to make sure that as much as possible they have access to water and sanitation that can happen 
by linking these agencies, these uh, schools, especially with people who are able to help. It, these blanket programs, I think, will not help. But if you can say X number of children, 100 children in the school don't have uniforms, and if you can get somebody who will donate those uniforms, Sri Lankans are very good in disasters. I think we saw it very well in the tsunami. And in a disaster, I think people are, it, this is a disaster. If children cannot go to school, it is a disaster for Sri Lanka. Let us try and see how we can link up these school, schools which have need just that little bit of help to make sure that the children, especially the girls, stay in school. My final question to you, how do we go about making people a partner in community development? I think it, the, the, it starts with reaching out in different ways. It, you can be a university person, you can be an administrator, but it has to come from shedding your power, your policy, your politics and reaching out to the other person. It's person to person contact which will help you bridge, do that bridging. Mm. And that bridging is being done by many people. I know there are people who are helping children, who are helping schools, but again, like I said, targeted assistance. Because this is a, we are in for this for the long haul. This is not a crisis which is going to end in one year. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Kosum Apukorala, Regional Chair, Global Water Partnership, South Asia. Thank you so much for coming here today and for sharing your perspectives and expertise. Thank you, Sonali. And if I may leave you with the last words, again, it is in that picture. Mm -hmm. Never give up. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you for watching us. We'll see you again next Monday with the single edition of the People's Platform. Have a safe weekend. Good night.